the Yukon and north of the 55th parallel lies a wilderness both beautiful and terrible to all but the most expert woodsmen, such as the Cree Indians who make this land their home. Here in the early winter, the Cree and his family set out across the icy Wapiti River. An important feature of the party is the trapper's small pack of dogs. They are of mongrel breed, husky, collie, and wolf, extremely hardy, well-trained, and most important to this expedition into the wilds. The horses are unpacked. For beyond this point, there are no trails. The going is tough, and traveling must be done on foot. Winter supplies are sorted and made into small packs. Only the essentials are included, for these Indians have been living off the country for centuries, and even today they require but few of the white man's so-called necessities of life. Each pack must be evenly balanced so it will ride properly on the back of its beast of burden. Yes, it is the dogs that carry the packs from here on. This one's name is Skookum Tum Tum, which means strong and brave in the Cree language. He is the leader, about 12 years old, and can carry a 25-pound pack, almost half his own weight. The general rule is to load a dog with a pack weighing about one-third of his weight. These packs must be secured so they will not slip or shift on the trail. This one is Tillicum, or little friend. He's just a pup, and it's his first trip. One by one, the dogs are loaded and their packs carefully adjusted. We do not normally think of dogs as beasts of birth. However, long before horses were introduced into North America by the earliest Spanish explorers, Indians were using dogs as pack animals. They are never overloaded and are quite accustomed to the work. There are no trails through the snow and shadows of these deep north woods, but the Indian is at home here and the dogs follow faithfully and obediently. A brief stop is made to check the packs, for particularly tough going lies ahead. The rest of the Indian's family will soon catch up, and a crude but adequate winter trapping camp will be built. Occasionally, the little pack train emerges onto open barrens, but even here, traveling is not easy. Skookum is not quitting, he's just sitting down for a rest, for it's a long, hard trip. Fortunately, there is always an end to every day, when the heavy packs are slipped off, and how good it feels. Healthy dogs like to roll in the snow the minute the pack is removed and they give their faces a good washing too, just as any man does at the end of a hard day. Work from daylight to dark is their usual lot, but once the packs are off, they often have enough pep left to go bear hunting. They know better, however, than to leave camp without their master's permission. Before setting out his traps, the Cree makes a short trip to look over the terrain and clever these Indians are in reading and understanding the most minute signs left on the snow or the ground by every form of animal life. To be good trappers, they have to be practical naturalists of the highest order. They can cross a slippery log over an icy stream with the sure-footed skill of a fox. With his pack of dogs trailing obediently, the Cree starts out to set his trap line, just as his tribe has been doing for centuries. The remnants of an old camp are passed, and soon he is chopping down a green sapling with his hunting knife, the first step in making his primitive trap. 
The sapling is carried to the selected spot, away from where it was cut. A small but strong wire noose is attached, and the sapling is skillfully put in place so that the wire noose or snare will hang in the proper position over the well-used run of the fur-bearing game. Thus, as the unsuspecting lynx, fox, or fisher runs along the trail, its head will be caught in a wire noose, and it will be held until the trappers return. Another snare is attached to a tree lying in a natural position across a game trail. Many such snares will be set throughout the area. In doing this, great skill is used, for trapping is the principal occupation and main source of income of these Indians. In camp, the trapper's wife is busy dressing the pine squirrels that have already been snared. The skins of these animals will probably wind up as a fine fur coat on Fifth Avenue. As many as 40 or 50 squirrels are caught in a single day, and the sale of their stretched and dried skins will provide almost half of the family's income. During the three-month season, this tree family should take enough fur to realize about $2,500. Everybody traps and everybody works. Notice that fine black fisher skin hanging in the back of the lean-to and the big links the man is working on. These will bring fancy prices at the trading post. Even when the snow becomes deep and the temperature drops far below zero, the Cree and his dogs must go out to tend the traps, although there are times when the fur-bearing animals seem to disappear. Then a hunt for bigger game is necessary for hunger sometimes makes life difficult and distressing for man and dog. Half wild though some of these dogs are, they are trained to hunt mountain lion, bear, and moose. They know that a big moose will mean plenty of food for themselves and their master. When given the word, they hunt like a pack of wolves, although success does not always crown their efforts. All of the furs are taken for the purpose of sale or barter at the trading post. However, the skins of moose and caribou are often kept by the trapper and tanned into native buckskin for the making of moccasins and other articles for family use. The Indian is not a fast traveler, but his steady, ceaseless plodding takes him surprisingly long distances through the wilds. Sometimes he will travel for several days to follow the trail of a moose, and at night, even in the coldest weather, a quickly improvised crude lean-to of brush is his only shelter. Dogs are sent ahead, and the game is finally located. There he goes. Occasionally, a dog is killed before the Indian reaches the scene. But success means food for all, and lots of shoes for baby. Rugged and often cruel, though winter life may be for both Indian and dog in the wilds of this far northwest, this has been their land and their way of life for hundreds of years, and they richly deserve all the rewards of their labors. At the end of the season, the dogs carry out the fur, a lighter load than they carried in. It's a dog's life, all right, for both man and beast, but without the beast, the man could not survive. 